president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. We do have secret prisons. That is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Tonight, my guest is Matt Robbins. He is with the uh, American Majority, That's right. I believe it's called, which is a conservative think tank. And we are debating the 99%, specifically the 99% of Americans that seem to be left out of much of the wealth in this economy. As I'm sure you know, unless you're living in a cave somewhere, there is a large movement that began occupying Wall Street and is now occupying, well, virtually every city in the country. There's Occupy Washington, Occupy Chicago, Los Angeles, you name it, every small town, it seems, is being occupied. It's even a global movement. Uh, my understanding is that they're starting the occupation movement in cities all across the globe, uh, Paris, Berlin, London, and so forth. What are the people protesting about? Well, the essence is they're protesting about the 99%. The 99% that's left out. Right now, 1%, at least in the United States, has 40% of the nation's wealth. That's just 1 in 100 Americans with 40% of the nation's wealth. That's the highest it's been since the 1920s. In fact, just uh, in the about 10, 15 years ago, the last time I saw it, the 1%, the top 1%, had only one third of the nation's wealth. So the rich are getting richer, and the middle class and the poor are getting poorer. The median income in the United States has gone down $7,000. After inflation, it's gone down $7,000 in the last 10 years. So are the middle class in America getting poor? And if so, is there anything the government should do about it, or should the government just stay out of the way? Well, Matt, let me first pose that question to you. Is there any problem with income inequality in the United States? Oh, there's definitely a problem, Mark. And I think that the common misperception is that the folks at the, at the stereotypical or cliched far right are somehow... Is that you? I am on the far oh, right. All right, okay. Absolutely. Just, 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 just check it. And Go I ahead. Think, I think folks <laughs> think that the, that the folks that came out two and a half, three years ago and formed the first Tea Party rallies and the first tax day protests are somehow not as angry as these Occupy Wall Streeters at the crony capitalism, at the corrupt bastards, if you'll pardon the word, that are in those offices I, I, upstairs. I don't need to pardon the There's word. There's a lot I, of agreement I, there is a lot uh, of around agreement. the ends of this, of this spectrum. And I think everyday Americans and middle class Americans especially can find a lot of room to work together and get government out of sort of rigging the game. And, and it, 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 it amuses me to no end, Mark, to watch the current president parade around the country on our taxpayer dime and talk about Wall Street while he's simultaneously receiving millions and millions of dollars in donations from Goldman Sachs, other groups on Wall Street. And, it's and, it's and, hypocritical at best. And likely to be running against Mitt Romney, who's Mr. Bain Capital. Uh, I don't know whether he's a billionaire or not. He's probably, he may he's well be close. a billionaire. He, he looks like a billionaire. Uh, he, he may well be a billionaire, <laughs> someone who certainly is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. We, we are certainly and, not for Mitt Romney on the right. Uh, well, now, we'll talk about that, too. We I, shall. Uh, later on in the broadcast, I want to get into the 2012 Great. candidates and, and uh, what you think about all of them, and specifically get into Herman Cain's 999 oh, yes. plan. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. But let's focus on Occupy Wall Street for the moment, because I'm going to agree with you that, well, we, we both know there's a lot of anger in America. Tremendous. And it's on the left, it's on the right, it's in the center. I would argue that the, the anger is there. People feel that their, their basic living is being slipped slipped away. I mean, either they're long-term unemployed, or they're a student and they're not able to get the loans for, for school they used to be able to get, or you have uh, people working uh, twice as hard, maybe have two jobs trying to get the same wage they used to get before. Sometimes you have families where both spouses are working just to make the same wages that one wage earner used to make in the 1970s. I don't think you dispute any of that. Well, I'm not an economist, and, I, and I'm not exactly as astute on the numbers as you are. And I know you can slice and die statistics to, to favor your argument. Much of the time, but it's However, tougher for the middle class. You're not, coming you, you from can the middle class, the I can tell you that it has been it's very hard tougher. for middle class families. I often mention the fact that my father grew up poor, and yet in the 1950s, he was able to put himself through college solely on a summer construction job. That's and, impressive. And with that, he could go to a state university. And it wasn't that he was impressive. Right. Uh, it was that really anybody could on three months of working at construction could pay for a state university, which I think was $1,000 a semester wow. or, something, or something at that time. 
you just can't do that today. So students are upset. I don't know that it can't be done, Mark. I don't know that those jobs. You think a summer job could put you through college? Well, I worked, I, I worked at the, in the glamorous field of, of corn syrup production during my college semesters in between private uh, college. And I, I chose to go there myself uh, based on, on my family background. But it, it didn't pay for the whole year, but it paid for a goodly chunk of my semester, my room and board. Not all the tuition, but a good chunk. And we took that job. At, at a state university? No, right. I'm sorry, at a private at school. At a private university? At a private school. It paid well, for about a semester. Uh, you uh, were a good corn surper because well, I, it, I'm it was surprised. a high paying job, and the college kids were happy to have it. And there were a limited so number this of those is a slots. A factory job. A factory job. All right, I, I, I have no idea what you're going to say, <laughs> but I'm going to ask anyway. Was right. it a union it job? It was a union Aha! job. It was. I would suggest to you that I would you never were lie paid to you, well. Mark. You were paid well because it was a union. Well, I've, I've, it's funny you bring that up because we were, you know, we were 18-year-old kids and, and naive as all get out. And I remember with with horror and, and and I remember the pride I had on my face when I received my first paycheck. And I couldn't believe the figure after working 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, overtime, time and a half, double time on Sunday. And I have to admit, one of the union regulars saw these college kids getting that kind of money, and they put a stop to the overtime hours for the college kids. My first experience with unions. Well, one of the things the unions do is make sure that every that everyone's earning No one else wages. wanted that overtime. Uh, but, no one um, else wanted that double time. Uh, I can assure you. And had, I can't extrapolate if, that to if, if all If you didn't cases. have a union job, uh, I don't think you would have gotten near those kinds you of wages. You may be right. But going back to the main point that the middle class is falling behind, and I think they are, and I actually agree with you that the anger of the Tea Party and the anger of the Occupy Wall Street movement is largely... A, rises out of this same frustration with trying to get ahead in today's economy. I would argue the difference between them is not the anger, which I think is severe in both cases, but who they blame. And that the Tea Party blames the government, and the Occupy crowd blames big business and Wall Street. And they have the same problems, well, the, the same issues, they just blame different people. The Tea Party started, if you recall, after Rick Santelli's ran on CNBC. I mean, these folks were all about the fiscal get-your-house-in-order stuff. They were all about the anti-Wall Street stuff. At least so they, at first. they agree on Wall Street. They then. they do. Uh, this crowd we're seeing right now, I think, are substantially different. They have a lot of grievances, Mark, that are really extraneous to the economic issues going on. When but they list do, but when they list many. their list of demands and ask for universal health care and free education and forty thousand dollar you know a year guaranteed jobs. There are no guarantees in America, Mark. I mean, that's the system. We I don't know, know that. too many that were asking for forty thousand dollars guaranteed jobs. There. But to me, universal health care is part of the problem. In fact, I think that. Uh, if companies didn't have to provide that bottom line for people, if this was something where, just like in Canada and France and England and Japan and every other industrialized nation on earth, uh, you could go, if you were sick, go to the doctor of your choice and get care and not have to worry about having to pay for it, that would be a tremendous, uh, frankly, load off people's minds. They wouldn't have to stress about that. It's, so I actually think that is part of the problem. It's not paradise. Waiting lists are part of those, are those countries' industrialized medical systems. Uh, we all know the stories of people seeking care here in America to be on a shorter treatment schedule, but, you know, that's a, a genuine... I don't know about you, but if I, if I call my doctor, unless it's an emergency, I can't get an appointment the next oh, day. Oh, I can see my guy anytime. Oh, well, He's you, great. Probably, you probably pay more for that. I might. <laughs> you I might. might well. But it seems to me, though, it's interesting when you say the Tea Party blame Wall Street, too. So let's talk about what... I think that message has gotten muddied in the past few years. Well, let's talk about years. whether you agree that Wall Street is to blame. Because Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned, this whole financial crisis, and it is a financial crisis, and it's a recession caused by a financial crisis, I know too many people that argue that the deficit caused the recession, no. or Obama, or the Democrats, no. or even... It's, well, I do find it, the folks in the Democratic Party putting a lot of blame on the Republican Party and well, on the, blame, the last president. The blame, Somehow, every deregulation the, over the well, last 40 exactly years right. the resides blame, with George W. Bush the blame, and directly resulted in this massive... I mean, it's a very complex fraud. The blame is fraud. not that the government caused the crisis, at least on our scale. The blame is the government right, allow, specific. Uh, allowed Wall Street to cause the crisis. So government, by not regulating Wall Street... It didn't happen overnight, Mark. Did, I understand I mean, that. these things took decades to come into well, place. Well, I wouldn't say they took decades. It's a decades. highly complex I actually think set of circumstances, whether you deal with the housing market, whether you deal with the bubble, whether you deal with this idea of Clinton and Barney Frank and others, suggesting that every American should be in a home and should own a home. But that's, that's not what caused the crisis. It's part and parcel of it. I, I don't think so. I think you'll find that the housing crisis was, if you will, mere, the mere spark oh. that set off the gasoline. It's, it's like the October 1929 collapse of the Wall Street. To me, the housing crisis was the spark, the gasoline, as it were, 
was $60 trillion in uh, credit derivative swaps where you had these massive Wall Street Couldn't banks agree more. Uh, that were making bets on other people's bets and on their streams of income. Criminal acts and, of fraud and, you're and talking about. Absolutely. Criminal acts of fraud. And in fact, to me, criminal acts of fraud on the behalf of Moody's and Standards and Poor's absolutely. that rated this junk as AAA. There's and, a movie and, coming out about this, Margin Call. And, and I, I think it's exactly right. And to me, what Congress did, maybe not criminally, but certainly mistakenly and wrongly, is they... They, they didn't regulate these things. In fact, they even removed regulations that used to exist dating back to the 1930s, things like Glass-Steagall, things like the law against bucket shops, allowing Wall Street, because as far as I'm concerned, Wall Street is, is a certain bunch of criminals in the sense that if you don't closely watch them, they are not only going to steal themselves blind, they're going to steal the rest of us up blind. Well, they're going to they're gonna run, they're going to overheat the engine of the American economic miracle. They're going right. to run that and greed... Right. Is sort of the so can you and I agree that we need a much stronger, much more effective Securities and Exchange Commission to watch over these people? Otherwise, we're all in trouble. I, I don't know, and, and any good conservative, any good free market conservative, will sit here and will not sit here and tell you we need more regulation. If Chris Cox and the SEC under President Bush had done their damn job, and they didn't, it would have been a different scenario. Well, but they didn't. There, who's I would the guy argue, on 60 Minutes that sent letter after right. letter, the whistleblower? I, I saw that too. My God! Right. That's I mean, right. why isn't Chris Cox sitting that, in the dock somewhere? Well, I, and this I, is incompetence I, I at best. I certainly agree. It's the, remarkable that the SEC did not regulate the way they should have. So and, I don't know that adding another point. layer. You say, I mean, adding another layer. When I say well, another you're layer, saying stronger regulations, more regulations. I don't want to just create another department. Or you know Elizabeth I, uh, Warren's I, new commission. Well, we we could talk about we, her we new can, commission, we which, can. which I do. Support. But I, I want the laws. But, but, it's, but, it's like gun laws, but, Mark. I want the laws that are that are on the books to be enforced. But my point That's is, what the I laws want. were taken off the books. My point is, in the 1930s, but they were. Yeah, they were. Let, me give, you, let, me, let me give you some examples. In the 1930s, uh, Franklin Roosevelt put in the Glass-Steagall Act Correct. to try to convince, uh, you know, to separate banks and brokerage firms. Uh, there's actually a law dating back to the Panic of 1907 yeah. called the Bucket Shop Law. Yeah. Which basically said that you can't gamble on stocks the way you gamble on horses. If you have to, you have to own a share. Right. Of it. You can't bet that this person's going to fail right. and then make money from it because there's a little. It's, it's kind of like betting someone's house is going to burn yeah. down and buying insurance on their house. Correct. It's it's not. It has it's moral. It has dishonest. moral hazard. Yeah. Let's say. So, but these these laws were removed by the Republican Congress. Some in the 90s under Clinton. Some some in the 80s under for, Bush. For adding that. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Always Republican Congress, but sometimes under President. Sometimes Clinton. centrist Democrats. So, some, sometimes under President Bush. Some centrist Democrats and the removal of these regulations, I would argue, is how Wall Street stole us blind. But I want to get you a chance to respond to that. We got to take a break. Sure. I also want to encourage folks to call in. If you want to join in this discussion, it's easy to do. Just pick up the phone and dial 888-488-MARK, M-A-R-K, 888-488-6275. You can feel free to disagree with me, disagree with Matt, disagree with both of us, or tell us how we're both right, which I don't know if that's easy to do or not. <laughs> but please feel free to do that. And we'll be right back with your calls and uh, with my guest, Matt Robbins, right after this. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899 0089 Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 guys. Stop, stop playing. No. 127 seconds. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. 
Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, together with my guest today, Matt Robbins of the American Majority. We're actually finding surprising agreement, which I always like as a liberal and a conservative to find when we can. We both agree that the people in the Tea Party and the people in the Occupy movement both feel that uh, they're sort of middle class people being screwed over. The question is, who's, who's harming them? Who's, do, who's doing the... Uh, the screwing, so, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I, I would argue, that obviously, uh, Occupy Movement blames mostly Republicans. The Tea Party blames mostly Democrats. Not exclusively, though. Not exclusively. Uh, but I guess my focus is, before we get to the role of government, which I know they strongly disagree on, I want to talk about the role of Wall Street. Because uh, it seems to me that we agree that relatively few individuals. I mean, you know, we're talking less than... Identifiable a, individuals. Right. I mean, we're talking maybe a few thousand folks in the world Cause this massive economic world crisis. I bet it's smaller than that. It may, it may well be. I was I was trying to be generous. Yeah. I would say it's clearly less than ten thousand. It may even be less than one thousand. So here you have a few extremely powerful individuals, extremely rich individuals. Uh, many times they did it mistakenly and they lost their own shirts. But whatever right. it is, whatever it is, for eight hundred fifty-three people, and I'm throwing out a number right, there, right. or or even if it's eight thousand people, to take down the world economy suggests to me that those eight hundred fifty-three or so people are too powerful, that no one should be too big to fail. We should not have an economy that allows 800 or so people to take the whole world economy down. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and, and you had to use that phrase, too big to fail. Uh, of course, the book and, and the HBO film after it, you know, President Obama basically mandated at the very beginning of his term that General Motors was too big to fail. People in the Tea Party, people in the, on the far right, people in the middle on these issues are not happy with anybody not being subject to the same rules that they are in their everyday lives. They have to make their, bud their budgets balance. They have to make their checkbooks balance every month. And yet, whether these people are on Wall Street, whether they're in a union-protected, favored by Democratic administration industry, they're somehow accepted, somehow carve-outs. And that's a real problem I see for, General for Motors. Pain. Regular Americans. It's hugely different from these financial. It is hugely different. I, I just and, and I, I, I only I, said I really, that because you brought that phrase. No, up. but I want I want to distinguish it because I think it's very important. Uh, the reason why General Motors was considered too big to fail was because millions of American workers would be out of a job, and when that same argument was made about some of the first banks. Well, we'll talk about the banks in a second. Yeah. But as far as General Motors is concerned. If we had not bailed them out, I don't think anyone disputes millions would be out of a job. And even more so, the government, not after bailing them out, has now made a profit. We've actually returned every single penny we've given to General Motors and gotten back some, just like actually back in the 1970s. It, it all depends on what the final stock share sells for. Well, so the government so, has so 500 far, so far million we're making, shares. So far right. we're making a profit. They haven't cashed them out yet. Uh, they have not, but, yeah, if they cashed that's them a big out, but if they cashed them out today, we would make a profit. Today, you're right. And... Uh, I should note that a Republican president, Gerald Ford, it was a very different time. Very different time. Bailed out Chrysler in the 70s. It's a whip inflation and now. also made a profit. So, um, I, but the car companies, I think, are different. We did not bail out the banks. So what you're getting at, when you're talking about presidential administrations what, of, of both stripes, bipartisan uh, you know, legislation here, you're talking about carve-outs that the average American has no access to. And that's what Tea Partiers well, and Occupy Wall Streeters are pissed off about, Mark. I think there's a big they, difference they feel between, out between of the General Motors and, and Wall Street. Economically, for one, for, perhaps. No, no, but let me tell you why. For one thing, ordinary, a lot of ordinary Americans work for sure. General Motors. A lot of right? ordinary Americans work at banks. Um, Bank of America has how many hundreds of thousands of employees? Those aren't the people that were You know what I'm out. saying, though. But those I mean, aren't the people to, that were better. and that I, isn't agree. the reason we... But look, if you want to talk about rank-and-file middle-class Americans who un, go to get a job... Unlike a car company where you've got a bunch of factories in Detroit that would sit idle and we only have three and one couldn't take over You're saying the banks other. don't make anything. No, what I'm saying is it's very easy to substitute one bank for another. It's very easy to change the plaque on the door and have those Bank of America workers go Fargo's work for Wells right Fargo. Now, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's happening all the time. They wouldn't be out of a job. Whereas a guy who's a tooler who knows how to create... A tradesman, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 some, the, the part, the carburetor, let's say. Right. Uh, there's only three main oil companies in the United States, yeah. uh, main auto companies, and there isn't that kind of substitution. But the reason we, we bet out the financial companies was not 
And this is important not to save any individual bank. In fact, we have a very wonderful institution called the Federal Deposit Insurance Correct. Corporation, which you know all about, yeah. which allows banks to fail, right. thankfully does. Well, in theory, and, allows Well, absolutely. Fail. It's not just in I theory. I think some more banks should have been allowed to fail. It's not just in theory. It's in practice. Uh, a, a lot. We've had more banks fail in the last three years, probably than any time since Agreed. the Great Depression. Agreed. But the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is fully funded. It's funded by, not by taxpayers, but by the banks but themselves. But Paulson and Bernanke said, by the banks Lehman themselves. Brothers is okay, well, Bank well, of America well, is not. Well, that, we're going to talk about that. But my my point is, when it comes to regular banks, we have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It has worked well. I don't think even Republicans are criticizing the FDIC. No, they're not. And it has it has paid off the Fed's every a different single. Story, but the FDIC well, is it not. has paid off every bank that's gone under, and no shareholders have lost money, right. and no depositors have lost money, and uh, the banks get redone over the weekend. It's it's an amazing institution. Yeah. Thank you, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, <laughs> for the FDIC. <laughs> the problem, it seems to me, was not the pure banks. The problem was these mixed financial institutions that didn't have an FDIC, the AIGs of the world, the Lehman Brothers of the world, the Goldman Sachs of the world. They were the problem. They were the ones who, because let's face it, a bank has to keep a certain amount of reserves right. ready in case it goes under. It has to pay insurance to the FDIC right. in case it goes under. Banks were actually pretty well regulated. It wasn't the banks that I criticized. It's these larger financial institutions, some of which were banks doing non-banking things. People Agreed. like Citibank Agreed. and so forth. Some were like Countrywide Mortgage well, doing absolutely. All sorts countrywide of mortgage financial could hardly you know. be called a bank. So I, I, it, it had was, a lot of financial power. It was technically a bank, but the point is, the banking business is not my complaint. And I don't think, for the people who know what's going on, that's the complaint of the people who are occupying Wall Street. It's not the banks; it's the investment brokerage firms, uh, some of which were banks that were betting in the trillions of dollars. And, and, and one thing is very interesting about this is that, for example, AIG supposed to be an insurance company. Right. In fact, uh, for many years, it, most of its life, it was an right. insurance company. That's what the acronym stands for, right? American Insurance Group. Never exactly, and it was very respected and very staid and very normal for most of its life. Yeah. When did Wall Street right. get so sexy and well? Uh, and well, I would argue it's when they ended that law on bucket <laughs> shops. I want you to look into that. But what they did is they basically sold. I think it was Oliver Stone. They sold insurance without reserves. That's what they did. That what is a credit derivative swap? It's a very fancy name for something that's insurance, but they don't want to call it insurance. Right. They're going to call it a swap. A right. swap of payments. It's it, worthless paper. Well, the reason they're calling it a swap is if they call it insurance. It gets regulated. Every state in the United States regulates insurance companies quite, and, and quite is, strongly. And so they said, we're not going to call it insurance. We're going to call it a but swap. Mark, Mark. And that will be our loophole. And now we can trade trillions. And, bring, and if we fail, we'll bring the whole but economy But you assume down. that the same crafty bastards who created credit swap you know, defaults and derivatives aren't going to find another manner and another product to create from whole cloth and name and term some new thing and find and another way to escape do, regulation. Let's stop them. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I mean, that's like saying we, I can, we, agree we more. shouldn't kill the terrorists but, because because if we stop them no. from bringing guns on the uh, guys on the planes, they'll, they'll bring on something else. It has nothing to do with I'm, that. I'm, no, that's the TSA's approach right well, now, Mike, and it's confident. grossly inefficient. I agree with you <laughs> that, that that Wall Street will find. I mean, how, any how much tighter way. can we get the straitjacket? They're I, still going to find a way to squeeze some air into it. I am confident that Wall Street will find every way. They will because human nature. And at the same time. I want our cops. I got, there are just as many smart people that can join the SEC as can join Wall Street. There are just as many smart people that can be in government. In fact, I, wish I would that argue were the case. those bucket shop laws actually stopped them from doing the very thing they did. Interesting. But, but Congress repealed it. The Glass-Steagall had a major effect in preventing some of this stuff. So who's your legislative champion that's, that's pushing a hundred-year-old law? Well, um, uh, the, the, you mean to bring back yes, the law? Yes, bring back the well, bucket my shop. Legislative champion Why don't I see this on the, is, month, the Sunday morning It's a senator morning by the name of Chris Dodd and a congressman ah. by the name of Barney Frank. Yeah, everyone's favorite. I would argue the Dodd-Frank bill took tremendous They're effort. They're trying to eviscerate that right now. Uh, well, that's what your Republicans right. are trying to do. And I some, would argue. Senate Democrats. I would argue the Dodd-Frank bill did a tremendous didn't didn't solve everything, but right. came a tremendous way into and locking the door after the horse escaped the, the barn. Same Chris Dodd from Countrywide. Locking the door. I, just, what, just checking. I, I'm telling you, the bill. It's a good bill. But for whatever reason good. he did it, good. it's a good bill good. because what it does is, yeah, the horses escaped the barn, but it locks the door so no more horses can <laughs> escape. That's important. And, and it, it's very important, I think, to make sure that these financial regulations are in place. And I got to say, your party's doing a tremendous job to make sure they're not in place. And my question is. Are you well, mad that's at your not party? My party? Well, is there, are you mad at the Republican Party? Yes. For protecting Wall Street yes, and I trying am. to keep them from undergoing these regulations? Uh, I think any sort of Nixonian law and order conservative, any member of that silent majority you and I have discussed many times prior, is is rightly upset that again there is a carve out. There's some sort of exception. 
it doesn't make sense to Tea Partiers, doesn't make sense to Occupy Wall Streeters, doesn't make sense to union members, why the rules that are on the books, why the SEC regulations, why the folks who are supposed to be watching Bernie Madoff are not fraud doing fraud. their damn and jobs. it shouldn't be allowed. It's not complicated. Right. The filmmaker who made Inside Job, a small documentary that has won huge awards, I think it won an Oscar, he said not one person has been prosecuted for the crimes in my two and a half hour documentary. That was a year and a half ago. This new movie is going to come out in two weeks. I'm sure no one will be prosecuted. This is an this amazing film. amount of agreement on it's, left it's and right. This I, is common American sense. I agree with you. I could what agree I would with call you horse more. sense to borrow your point. I could agree with you more. So uh, I think then hopefully we can agree on the next step, which is that no institution should be so big, no small group of people. I mean, if we're going to have our economy mess up, at least have millions cause it, and, <laughs> and not have 800 people, uh, you know, ruin. I'm not really happy with the, the millions the, of Greeks the and Italians messing up the world's economy. Right well, now. you could argue it's I'm mostly, really it's mostly the that. governments, which are smaller you numbers. You could argue it's a cultural reflection but, too. But uh, you could, and we can talk about culture can, in a minute because I want to talk about Tea Party and Wall Street. Good. But uh, it seems to me that we agree that no institution in America should have that much power. I, I, I can go back, and again, I'm a student of history, I go back to the 1890s. Right. And prior to the Federal Reserve being created, there were about six industrialists. I can name Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan. Don't say Robert Barons. Please don't say Robert Barons. I said industrialists. Thank you, thank you. They were Robert Barons. Uh, <laughs> so, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller. Because you I, can't I, make a million dollars honestly in America, right? They made hundreds of millions. And never and did anything good with it. They had, well, Carnegie did, but they had the money supply. Basically, they had so much of the money supply before the Federal Reserve. I always think of this when I'm arguing with a Ron Paul supporter. I say, do you really want our money supply in the oh, control that, that, of six wealthy industrialists? Because our government like catnip to the Ron ran Paul. out of money in the Panic of 1897 yeah. and literally went be, to these six alone. individuals yeah, yeah. to get a loan. Right. That can't be the solution. Well, let's talk about monopolies. Let's talk about antitrust. Let's and let's talk, talk about, about a little bit of power, a, a huge amount of power being held by a very very small amount well, of that's people. what the anti-monopoly laws are, are about, and I don't think there's any conservative that really disagrees with those. So you, you, know, you like things, antitrust laws. You like breaking I, up monopolies. I, I you, think, you don't think any company should be too big I don't to think fail. anybody should. I don't think there should be one telecom network in America. I think we tried that We're agreeing once. on way too much tonight, Matt. I, I think I'm that's terrific. You, Mark, there's a lot of agreement on the right I, and the I left. think that's terrific. So uh, there are actually The politicians things, in the middle are trying to well, divide I, and conquer these electorates. I, I think there's a lot that Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street agree on. So let, let's talk about it. Strong SEC enforcement. Absolutely. Even if it costs a few more money to get some really good, smart people in there and pay them the salaries necessary to have really strong, good people in there. I, I don't know what kind of jobs program you're talking about. What kind of lure? No, I'm just saying you know, that, the lawyers that program you you're can make. About. If you can make a hundred million on Wall Street, uh, you should be able to make a hundred thousand at the SEC because it takes a smart person to catch a smart person. I think you need to have competitive and, wages. And, exactly, yeah. and uh, making sure that the SEC has the tools it needs to go after not just the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme right. people in the world, but also the people who are busily creating new loopholes to whatever laws Congress passes. I think there needs to be significant oversight. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything, you know, anti-conservative in that. I think you ought to be able, forced to play by the you play by the rules in America. You should be able to get rich now legally. Don't some Republicans and call that significant oversight? Yeah which you and I both agree on, don't they call it regulation? I want, I want you to we'll take a break. I, I, I want to know after the, the break. The I want to know after the that. break if, because I always hear Republicans complain about regulation. To me, making sure that a company doesn't bet the farm and bet our nation's economy, that's regulation. It's a tightrope, Mark. And it's good regulation. Give us a call if you like, 888-653-7543. We'll be right back after this. Art a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact C. Fripp at AOL.com. Tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. 
But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit CheckYearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America. And reading is fundamental. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, finding surprising agreement tonight with conservative Matt Robbins of the American Majority. We're both angry at Wall Street. And now, let's face it, I'm a dying-the-wall Democrat. Matt's uh, Self-described far-righter. Self-described far-righter, though not necessarily a Republican. Not necessarily a Republican at all. Okay. So uh, we're both mad at the Republican Party then. We are. Although you're mad at the Democratic Party too. I'm very angry at the Democrat Party. I'm mad at some of the Democrats. Good there for are, you. There are some Wall Street Democrats that have done a lot to protect Wall Street. I do think the majority of my party, though, wants to regulate Wall Street and is on the side of the occupiers. But th there's no question. There are some in my party that and take Wall Street money. and Including and, the president. And, uh, well, yeah, the president gets some Wall Street yeah. money. Um, it gets the, a lot the of Republican, Wall Street money, Mark. Well, not near as much as Republicans do. Uh, but... So let's, but let's, here's the issue here. So we're all mad at Wall Street. Uh, I also think, though, the Occupy Wall Street movement is bigger than Wall Street and bigger than the brokerage firms. The Occupy Wall Street, when I hear them talk, and, and, and there's some that are radically off message, and, but, but sure. the majority of them that are talking are talking about the 99%. They're not just talking about the 1% in Wall Street and finance, which apparently you agree with me. I do. Is, has gone way, way too far. Uh, but really... The idea is that the middle class should have a chance, that everyone should have should an have equal... more than a chance. Uh, well, they should have equal opportunity. I mean, the American dream right. is that it's you can start with nothing and right. with, with a good education and work hard, play by the rules, you, you can achieve it. And this is Absolutely. something that we're trained to believe. This is something that immigrants come more to our country than all other countries Absolutely. combined to, to live it's the American dream. And I got to say, I think the American dream is dying. I think it's waning. I think it's... Uh, I'm not saying it's dead. I don't want it to right. be dead. But I think it's a lot harder to live the American dream than it was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I think we've been here before. I think there have been you know, periods of stagnation, and there have been, uh, oddly enough, under another Democrat president you know, 30, 40 years ago, Jimmy Carter. Uh, and there have been a right, lot of... You're not going to talk Bill Clinton's economy, because that was a pretty good economy. Well, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton had, a, to use your words, a conservative Congress, a Republican Congress, well, uh, for six, passing the, the budget bills. Years. He, also, yeah, he also had two years of Democratic Congress and passed a tax increase that led to the highest surplus ever in American history. He also history. had the Internet spinning off wealth like crazy, but we won't go too far into Bill's record. It was his birthday yesterday. We'll, let him, we'll give him a pass. Happy birthday, Bill Absolutely. Clinton. Absolutely. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Um, I think the problem is that these people that are out there protesting, whether they be the, the Occupy Wall Streeters or the Tea Partiers, they don't know what to do. They see a system that's basically locked them out. Broken. They don't, it is, I don't know the system is broken as much as it's become more sophisticated. And it's become more difficult to find what we call at American Majority, the pressure points and the points of intervention. You can still get into the office of your congressman. You can still reach your elected officials. And you can still exert pressure. But it is substantially more complicated because of lobbyists and corporations. And isn't it harder to exert like Wall pressure Street. when... You know, I can give $100 maybe to a campaign, although, frankly, that's probably more generous than, than I usually give. <laughs> Good for uh, you. I'm, I'm, more, I, I'm more of a $25 a, a guy. PJ Work says but, don't, don't, don't vote for the bastards. But, it encourages them. But, uh, you know, Exxon can give $10 billion. And under the Citizens United case, a multinational... I knew we'd get there. You, know, well, you have yeah. to, because one of the big things they're, they're fighting about in the Occupy Wall Street movement is public financing, is, sure. is, is finance of campaigns. And the Supreme Court has said that a, not just an American corporation, a multinational right. corporation, right. a Chinese corporation That's a can funnel tens of billions of dollars undisclosed yeah. to any presidential candidate they want and end up controlling our elections. You, you got to agree with me. That's a That's a problem. Decision. I wasn't aware of the carte blanche with, as far as the foreign multinationals. I thought they had to be American. They don't. They don't. They, they can be an American corporation, but see if they have 20% sure, foreign ownership. Sure, sure. That's the problem with corporations. Yeah, well, that's that's, that's it, a little it, bit of apples and oranges. Is GE an American there, corporation? I would if, argue if, no, it's not. Well, there you yeah, go. Yeah. So that's why I said a multinational corporation. I don't Very know if it could be 100% Chinese. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not saying that. But clearly, foreign money can influence our elections I still that think way. And it, I don't even care if it's an American money. Right. I don't want some billionaire giving a billion dollars undisclosed to Agreed. any presidential candidate. We don't take corporate money. We don't take Coke money. We're a small little ragtag group of trainers that go out and teach regular competition. So you're against Citizens well, United we are. as well. We are. We, we are firmly against it. 
We believe that everyday citizens can figure out. I'm not to, to take you to an Occupy Wall Street. You should. We'd love I, to talk to them. I, I don't. I don't. We'd know love to help them appear before a camera, a little more polished. <laughs> I mean, what part of competent and credible do you, well, you know, understand? You and I talked off air about the cultural we differences did. between the it's Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. It's a Street. gulf between They're, these folks. It's kind of the same differences in the 60s between it the clean cut uh, Vietnam veterans and the hippies. With it the, is. But, it, but that's a cultural difference. And really, the middle class is getting hurt, whether it's Republican or right. Democratic or, or a lot of them are, A lot of people in the information age with the Internet are able to figure this out for themselves. And a lot of folks have come to rallies and protests on the right, and now the, the different demographics are coming to the groups, to the protests, rather, on the left. But I think they're all sophisticated enough, just like we've gotten more sophisticated in our movies, and our TV, our entertainment. They realize what, who's getting shafted here. They don't necessarily know what to do about it. I don't think it's that complicated. I think the system exists largely still as the founders intended it to. The pressure points, the points of intervention, may be a little narrower. It may be a little more harder to whack that mole when he pops up. But it, they're still there. Well, let me give you a difference between Occupy Wall Street and, tea, and the Tea Party. I, I, actually, I didn't mean I, to hijack it on no, the Tea no, Party. No, 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 no. I actually think there's a lot of similarities there between are. them. And I think it's fascinating that they're not Organic getting... Organic movements. They're, not, they're both grassroots yeah, movements. Yeah. But that they're not getting together because of these cultural differences. But I think another thing is, frankly, they very much disagree on solutions. They, they, they may agree on problems, they, they disagree on solutions. They do. I think that the, Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street movement says the government can solve this problem by corralling the big businesses, watching them, regulating them, making sure they don't steal us blind. And the Tea Party says the government is the problem. Uh, and so, I, you know, one says the government can solve the problem, the other says the government is the problem. That's going to keep these two, these that, two groups that, from working that's, together. That's a lot of over, oversimplification, Mark. I, I, I agree with your, your sentiment, but I think the Tea Party would argue the government is the problem in much, many other areas of their lives. You know, too much taxation, too much interference, too much sort of Non. They're okay with the regulating Wall Street part. I think they are largely okay with prosecuting really? crooks. I really think. Well, but some of the stuff is legal. I think President Obama, I think stuff... Mitt Romney, for God's sake, could make hay. Well, he couldn't do it. But someone he else couldn't could do, do it. it. <laughs> could make hay with coming out with an anti corporate or anti, you know, Wall Street sort of agenda to, now, now to say, lock these folks you up. You say prosecuting the criminals. Unfortunately, a lot of this. Elliot Spitzer made a lot of hay out of this. A lot of this behavior was legal. Uh, let's face it. The credit derivative swaps were not illegal. It's I true. wish they were. It's true. They were under the old bucket shop laws. I, they they were not illegal. So uh, I think much there of probably this behavior is still a way to prosecute firms like Goldman Sachs, who with one hand are selling products and on the other hand are betting against them. Well, the they were actually. I you think may recall, is, You may recall the SEC fraud. did bring an action. Yeah. Yeah. Against Goldman Sachs, maybe yeah. you think they settled for too cheap. It was uh, only I think Goldman Sachs five hundred million dollars, which, 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 which is a, it's a day at the Hamptons. It's a to Goldman Sachs. For, for Goldman that's Sachs. right. Uh, but I actually think the laws could be much stronger. So, but let me just ask you the general question, which sure. I think divides the Tea Party from the Occupy crowd, and frankly divides liberals from conservatives. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in bad economic times? The government can solve or at least help solve the problem, help get us out of recession, out of depression, or do you think the government just gets in the way and makes things worse? I think typically they get in the way. I think typically they do. I now, think do you think it's because they don't have power, they literally can't do it? No, Mark. Or do you I'll, think it's just because they, they do it badly? I'll, I'll borrow your line on the left. You know, I love when you all accuse us of, of saying government's the enemy and that government is the problem, and then to which you all retort, Government is us. Government, we are the it government, is us. and that's the problem. Government's filled with incompetent people, just like us. <laughs> it's filled with people who don't make the right decisions, who don't, you know, make all the right calls. Who make do they ever do right? They do sometimes. Okay, they do. But, so it's not but by systemic, large. So it's not a systemic problem. You, it's, 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 no, it's, it's a it's a human problem. You just spent, right. you just spent several minutes talking about large groups of people when they get too much power and get too big. Having it really becomes a pressure cooker, really becomes a problem. That's the same way we feel about government. When you get so much power and so many bureaucracies and so many but agencies, here's the difference. It's a big problem. Here's the difference. The government is, or at least should be, when it's not transparent. The government, you uh, can call your member Mark, of Congress. Mark, you live in Washington D.C. Tell it me is, how transparent these agencies relative, around this it, town it's are. It's a lot more transparent. Have you than read Exxon? Top Secret America? It's a lot more transparent. <laughs> Have you read than the Washington Post Sachs? series? I mean, you're not going to tell me the, the Congress for all its. Dysfunctionality. Now we do hold we do hold the boobs up to some is, accountability. It's definitely more transparent than Goldman Sachs or AIG. <laughs> the or, Vatican or, is more transparent than well, Goldman but that's, Sachs. But that's my point. <laughs> that when you, that I don't like having my fate in the hands of either right. uh, business or government. Right. But I can tell you this: I do have some effect on my government. I don't know that I have any effect on big business. Uh, that's probably a fair point. Okay. That's probably so, a fair point. So it's not a systemic problem. The government can do the right thing. Yeah, and we it would just, argue... It just isn't doing the right thing. Right. A lot of the times it really, really makes the wrong calls. I mean, we can point historically... And, and when you say it makes the wrong calls, yeah. would you say that that's partly because uh, the government is being funded by a lot of the same people 
that it's helping? No, I think I think ideology gets in the, in the way. I mean, I, I mean, we could. You don't here. think there's a problem with a company X giving let's, let's, ten million dollars to, on, to a, a, a candidate, and then they end up giving ten billion dollar <laughs> tax break to company X? I think that that's a that's a quid pro quo. That's illegal. That would be fraud. That would be bribery. That would be it should you know, be bribery, exactly. but it happens. But let's let's show let, let's let's think. put Citizens United aside for a moment, and let's actually talk about government. You know, doing the right thing. I mean, the idea. These government servants are going to somehow make all the right decisions. It's just laughable. It's not. It's not reality. I mean, it just doesn't work out that way. I don't say government always makes the right decisions, but I say that government is accountable. And if they don't make the right you know, decisions, we, we, we can, should fire them. But we. But, but, you, but you can't. I mean, it's entrenched bureaucracy. It stays in. Sure, you They're can. I they seem can't to recall that uh, in uh, let's see, in 2006, the Democrats <laughs> sweeped into Congress by a large majority. Right, right. 2010, you all had your and in year. Your, and in your average and, and election cycle, 98% of incumbents remain unchallenged. Well, I every mean, single that's cycle. That's on both sides. Which is another issue. That's we, another that, issue that we agree on. But, but let's let's take the stimulus for a second. Let's just take Obama's stimulus for two two minutes. I mean, you could make an entire show out of this some night. And I know the standard uh, answer on the left is it wasn't big enough. I agree. The standard, it wasn't. the standard analysis of the stimulus. And I actually think it had some of the wrong elements. It absolutely had the wrong elements. I would have put I mean, more element. Uh, payoffs. I would, I would have done less tax cuts. To state and put unions more money and, and put state, more. I mean, it's remarkable. Payoffs to state unions. Make, bring in their balance sheets flush. I mean, these monies went all over the country, but they didn't go to the right places. Well, all these, all I these think we needed money. more money for infrastructure and less money for tax so cuts. So save the unions and sprinkle some more money around. Well, infrastructure is a good thing. I like bridges We're not and talking, roads I'm not talking and infrastructure. I'm talking That's what you're union talking about. payroll and pensions. That's what I'm talking about. Which pensions? The pensions, the Cadillac gold-plated plans in places like California and places like Missouri. That are, are, wait, are you talking about eight of the states? Eight of, yeah, absolutely eight well, of the states. Eight of the states? It was a huge part of the you, stimulus. But you don't want... Those kinds of strings, as a states' rights guy, you don't want the federal government to get. <laughs> I don't aid want the federal the government showering money on the states to begin with. But see, that's and they another, took federal tax dollars that, and did that's, it. But that's, I actually do very yeah. much want the government yeah. to share. That's a philosophical things. difference. Well, but let's talk about why. The reason is very simple. In a recession, all right, state governments. But budgets, that's a belief of yours. No, no, that's no, no, not no. An this fact. is pure economics, and I think you can agree with me on this empirical fact that all <laughs> 50 state budgets, in a time of recession, not just this recession, but every recession. It, it, it harms everyone in the state budgets. The reason is because they have to have a balanced budget. Less money comes in. Mark, fewer people pay the taxes reason because. State be, budgets. Well, hang on, hang on. Few people pay take taxes because they're hurting because of the recession. Right. More money comes out in welfare, unemployment aid, and so forth. In a recession, all state budgets go to heck. And the only difference between the states and the federal government is the federal government can print money <laughs> and states can't. And so, in a recession, and a recession only, the federal government has to be able to provide that liquidity because otherwise. State governments across the country are going to end up firing people not, right and left in the middle of a recession. Because, and you're not addressing the root cause. The reason the state budgets get in the, get in the gray areas and get in the red to begin with is because they don't ever plan for these inevitable recessions and rainy days to ever hit. They, have you seen Fairfax County where we sit? Have you seen these budgets? They build, they expand, they hire like there's no tomorrow, whether it's the roaring 90s or the internet but boom. Whether we it's should the hire in the middle of a recession. That's what we should be hiring. I'm it's not exactly saying the recession. worst I'm saying, time. I'm saying they, they plan like it's always going to be great times. I agree and then that when we the should bad run a come, surplus in good times. They run squealing to Papa and, and Uncle Sam. But you know what? Uncle Sam is necessary <laughs> to have that liquidity. It was necessary in the 30s. To bail their asses out. It's also necessary today. When we come back, I want to move on to the presidential campaign. Please. Because uh, there's a, uh, a lot of Republicans running, and i got to tell you, it doesn't look like your party likes any of them. I want to talk about what that is. Folks, last chance to join in. 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. Give me a call. Let me know what you think. Wash your car at home. When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? To protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh. Oh. 
maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. To the Inside Scoop, I'm your host, Mark Levine, with Matt Robbins of the Center Center for American Majority. The American Majority. The, just the American the American Majority. majority. Uh, he's a conservative, I'm a liberal. We found a lot of agreement tonight. Let's see if we agree on the Republican presidential candidates. Uh, Matt, I would say that the uh, Republican Party doesn't much like its choices. Uh, you know, Chris Christie says 12 times he's not going to run, and it seems like your party's on his knees begging, please, please, please Chris Christie, run. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Sarah Palin's not running. Mitch Daniels, uh, okay, Sarah Palin I don't take seriously. But Mitch Daniels, Chris Christie, I do take seriously. Um, the putative front runner, uh, Mitt Romney, I would argue your party dislikes so much that they're putting someone who really is shocked that he's even... <laughs> doing well, Herman Cain, according to the latest poll, is ahead, with Mitt Romney second, uh, Rick Perry third, uh, you know, Ron Paul always Polls got, his, snapshots, he's got his perennial 11%. Dr. Paul but, is always there. But would you agree with me that, as a general matter, the Republican Party is not happy with its candidates? Well, first, I'm glad you said the Republican Party instead of your Republican Party. It's not... It's not our party. Well, you told, me, you, you, you told right. me you're not a Republican. That's right. Well, that's let's right. just say, how about this? Conservatives, Conservatives are, are not, not happy with any of their choices. And that includes even Rick Perry. No, I disagree. I think, I think they're waiting on Rick Perry to, to ignite. I think it's sort of like failure. But they failure don't like his launch. stand on immigration. They don't uh, like uh, the, the... They like part of his stand on immigration. They like the they, fact they that like he... They like defense. They like defense. They don't like the in-state They don't tradition. like the DREAM Act. That's right. Right. Yeah. But, they don't like the Gardasil decision, which he's apologized for and put behind him. Yeah, somehow vaccinating to prevent young women from getting cervical it's, cancer is it, apparently a bad thing that's not in the conservative issue. world. The issue is executive order. The issue is government by fiat. That's the issue. We, we're, we in believe any, in, in leaving, case, us, leaving us alone, right? Before we get to Rick Perry, let's talk about, well, let's talk about Mitt Romney. Let's do it. Uh, can't, he's supposed to be the front runner. <laughs> he's supposed to be the guy, I, I, again, I, I saw Saturday Night Live last night, and right. you, you really, you really got to check it out. Yeah, check it out. Mitt Romney's like, that's okay. I'm the guy everybody settles for, you know, and 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 that's exactly how he's running. That's it's true. like, I, you know, I know you want all these other people, <laughs> but when they have all your fun, when they all self destruct, they'll all come yeah. to me. Do you think Mitt Romney will be the nominee of the Republican Party? I actually think he will be. I, I do mean, not. You do not. I do not. The, 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 you think that the dislike of Mitt Romney is so strong that someone else is going to get it? It's not someone else. I mean, the, it's I Rick think the field is settled. That's right. I think you think Rick Perry is going to win the nomination. I do. I think in, in any in, in any primary battles and any caucus battles. Intensity always wins, at least on the right. Intensity always wins over preference. And so the intensity of the conservatives' grassroots in Iowa. I mean, don't forget, we're three months away from these caucuses and primaries. So if you just do the electoral sort of march through the country, look at Iowa and who they voted for, Michelle Bachman. Look at New Hampshire. I'm sorry, Rick Perry's right-hand man, Dave Carney, has oh, been a New Hampshire no, resident. Mitt, no, Mitt Romney has to win New Hampshire. He's, he's we'll, governor of Massachusetts. We'll see. New Hampshire is very different than it used to be. Very conservative. You very think Rick Perry roots. can win New Hampshire? I do, and I think he can do the first three. I think he can do Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. Okay, so Michelle Bachman, she's gone. She's Rick, gone. Rick Perry stole all her thunder. Rick, I don't, I don't think there was any thunder to steal. Which, uh, the caucus, yeah. the, the straw poll means nothing. Uh, it really is irrelevant at this point. Okay. Yeah. All right, so Because you can flood that, she's that gone, event. She's gone, and Newt Gingrich is old news. New, no, Newt Gingrich was not ever news. All right, so, so <laughs> no, no one ever cared about him, and we right. all talked about Ron Paul's guy. He's very dedicated 10%. He does. I spent the weekend training some libertarians. Okay. But how about this Herman Cain fellow? How about Mr. Cain? Uh, it seems never to held me, elected office. Never held elected like Former CEO of Godfather. It's Father. impressive. It seems to me that people are... Herman Cain is the, 
I'm going to say I'm for Herman Cain because I'm a conservative and I think it's cool to show maybe that I'm for the black man. Oh, come or on, Or at the very least, that come I, I, I want to show my displeasure come for on. Romney. And, We've and already Mary. done this with Michael Steele, right? Uh, I, I'm kidding. I'm well, kidding. I'm totally that, that, kidding. That I want to sh- if I'm a conservative, I don't like Romney. I don't like Perry. And to show how much I don't like Romney and Perry, I'm going to vote for her. I'm going to say I'm for Herman Cain in the poll just to make but him realize these, how angry I am. These are snapshots, of Mark, of a thousand people here. Yeah, but how do you explain that? Uh, 4,000 attendees in Florida. 27% in the latest yeah, poll. Because, That's a quarter. Because the conservative base that is showing up at these events and is showing up at these debates. These are polls. They these are polls. These, these I, are, I understand, but they're, they're, but they're the shaped. Debates. They're shaped by the Florida CPAC. They're shaped by the debates. They're shaped by the public conventional wisdom and the perception of who's ahead. We all know the horse race aspect of politics. When the conservatives go into those booths and go into those tents in Iowa, they're in New gonna Hampshire, pick Herman King. they're not going to pick Herman Cain. And so, but so they are doing what I just said. They they're going to pick someone with a proven record of conservatism. They're supporting Herman Cain as a protest I think they probably, against both Romney and Perry. You agree with me on that? To some degree. I'll, I'll grant you that. Okay. They're pissed off that, that, that Perry made a couple of bad calls. One thing that Herman Cain is very famous for, uh, he's going around like a pizza salesman. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about his, pizza salesman. his 999. I know, that's why I said that. Uh, <laughs> talking about his 999 right. planet. This is not, and selling books. This is not pizzas for 999. Right, right. Uh, this is uh, throughout our entire tax system, estate tax, capital gains tax, payroll tax, right. income tax, throw it all in the toilet. 9% income tax, 9% corporate tax. And 9% national sales tax. Yeah, that's so a that winner in Republican circles. Every single thing, every price goes up right. 9%. Right. Um, yeah, tell folks in Tennessee and New Hampshire who have no state income tax that now they're going to have a VAT. Now, that's going to go over very well. You know, I got to tell you, I was on Fox News a year ago and with arguing with Megyn Kelly, and she insisted that the Democrats were going to put forward a VAT, a value-added <laughs> tax. And I said, I'm not so ab- sure you're not I going said, to. I said, absolutely, they're not going to. And she said, can you, what was the word she used? Can you Promise me. I want to use some strong word. Can you say? Cate- no, she said. Can you say categorically the Democrats will not do this? And I said, I will say categorically the Democrats will not do this. The only party that would consider doing it is the Republicans. And here comes here Herman Cain with are. his 999 plan. I love it. I, I love think it. Megyn Kelly may, all owe me, may, owe me an, may owe me an apology. She might. Uh, you're not a big fan of the 999. Plan. I'm not. I mean, I'm not. Again, I'm not an economist. I'm a grassroots political guy, and I can tell you that talking to those. Tea partiers and to those we the people and nine twelvers and disaffected Republicans and independents and anybody else we talk to, they they're not happy with any sort of added layer of government taxation. The whole point the tax. of the last two and a half three years was to real, roll back and repeal some of the tax burdens on the average Americans. Well, let me tell you my problem. With so it's it. a non-starter. Well, my problem with it is not just the national sales tax, which I'm opposed to, but also the fact that. What this really is, is a huge transfer of wealth, again, from the middle class to the it's rich. It's interesting how you because focus on those, those parts. I focus on the 99%. And we focus on this part. Uh, this is all about nines tonight. I focus on the 99% <laughs> who, who would pay more under right. the 999 plan, because what it does, it gives a tremendous tax cut to the millionaires and billionaires. And who has to pay for it? Uh, you know, the homeless guy in the street is not going to have to start Mark, paying Mark. federal income tax. You really, you really can't get worked up by this plan. We're not going to be talking about Herman Cain in a month if we do the show from now. Okay. We're really not. I mean, right. this was written by Steve Lowry or someone uh, in Iowa who, I, as far as I can tell, you know, works in a strip mall as a financial services advisor to, to Herman Cain. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, has anyone ever heard of this guy? Okay. So, Herman Cain aside, you think Rick Perry is going to come back from his, let's face it, disastrous <laughs> well, debates. debates. Debates don't win the presidential elections. They don't win the caucuses and primaries. Records win primaries and caucuses. And so Rick Perry, among this current crop, with the conservative grassroots, has a proven record, 10 years of Texas governing, 10 years of basically you know, keeping the folks there prosperous, keeping them secure, and being pretty damn good at it, being pretty confident so about it. So it's a Perry-Romney race. I think it is a Perry-Romney and race. And people can look past the DREAM Act and uh, the HPV uh, Republicans will not be happy about the in-state tuition that, that, uh, that, that Perry has talked about. Perry's, uh, Doesn't he support the Dream Act, though? Doesn't he support a path to citizenship? Not on a national level. He does not, because no. John McCain did and George Bush did. Right, not on a national At least he hasn't, hasn't said it to my he knowledge. He hasn't said so clearly. Yeah. You know, what's interesting but about Rick Perry... But it's a pretty canny strategy. I mean, is, if you're going to go for Hispanic vote in the general, if you're Rick Perry, that's a pretty smart political strategy. Uh, let me tell you something. Strategy. As, as a Democrat, I... Yeah. I, I he I, saves I, off 10 or 15% of that. I, you guys are cooked. As, as a Democrat, I want to see uh, the most right-wing, anti-immigrant <laughs> Republican nominee Absolutely. I, I can possibly find. I appreciate you being honest find. about that. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, you know, Herman, I would love to run against Herman Rick, Rick, Rick uh, wants frankly, to have... Michelle Bachman, yeah. uh, or Sarah Palin, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, Rick Governor Santorum. Perry. I can think of some great candidates wow. on your side wow. that You're we would love to run against. A lot of spaghetti on the wall. Wow. Governor Perry was very insistent on 
secure border. However, once the people were in the state, he realized, as any, as any governing politician does realize, you have to deal with the individuals that are in your, in your state. But Rick Perry, uh, I think you're going to concede, has done awfully in the debates. He seems completely, Not un well. he seems completely unprepared. He trips over his I words. Say he doesn't seem to know what room he's in. <laughs> I got to tell you, he makes George Bush look smart. That's and rough that's stuff. Just, that's rough stuff, Mark. <laughs> you know, what can I say? I mean, we've had, what, 49 debates already? This is an exhausting, Probably. grueling debate. I couldn't even find the last one. I don't even know what channel Bloomberg is on my on my cable system. It's remarkable we've had so I many I can also tell you that Democrats would prefer to run against Rick Perry than Mitt Romney. I, 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 liked, I like the, the briar patch mentality. I like, you know. Uh, now, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, we'd probably rather Romney be president than Rick Perry be president. <laughs> and but, that's why Mitt but, Romney will never win the but, Republican but, nomination. Well, now, you know, I... He he's Rick Perry's what at twelve percent or thirteen yeah, percent? Again, of this, is, this is October. I mean, talk to me again in December, January when these things are really humming along. Okay, so in your view, it is a two-man I mean, race. It is, it, it is a two-man race. I think so. Herman Cain uh, has Herman is Cain, having his moment in the sun. Herman Cain is is a is a wonderful man and an American success story. I think he adds a lot to the field, but I think it's time for the two main contenders to emerge. I okay. really do. I think it's time for the sideshows to stop now. Do you think Rick Perry and Mitt Romney are going to start really blooding each other? Because it seems to me for Rick Perry to get back in this race, he's got to take down Romney. He's got to go into all the many Romney flip-flops that have existed over the years. I don't think there's a whole lot of defining left to be done on Romney. I think the grassroots, again, the folks that are going to show up with intensity in these winter months in these states, they already know Mitt Romney's record. They're not happy with it. They're not thrilled with anything he's done. They, he can't get past 24% ever in that's, a poll. That's really interesting. Uh, no matter how much money he's getting. I, I have on here Republican Mike Lane a lot. And yes. He's a big Romney man. So I think maybe next wow. time I need to have the both of you two you together. Should. You should. And just, and just watch you duke it out as a Democrat. I'll just smile as you two attack. It would be like Obama Hillary. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. I'll just sit back and enjoy it. I was like, it. do your worst. Do your worst. I'll, I'll, I'll go back and enjoy it because he is, is certain that Romney's going he's to win. He's a nice man. He's, Governor Romney's a nice he's guy. He's certain that Romney's going to win as you are certain. That Perry's I, I will win. treat Mike to a delicious another, steak dinner. Another Texas governor. You yeah, I think that has very little to do with it. I think the American people are looking well, for results. Let me tell results. you something about Rick Perry. You know, millions of jobs created over the decade. Millions. I think is it... Well, let's talk about what jobs Rick sure, Perry created. Sure. Because it seems to me... Uh, there's a recent... Uh, in fact, since I like my statistics, I'll give yeah. you a statistic. Texas and Mississippi are tied for having the greatest percentage of minimum wage and below minimum wage jobs in the country. Yeah. All right. So it seems to me that Rick Perry is trying to compete with Mexico. He's not trying to compete with Germany oh. and Sweden and high class, high skilled, high educated jobs, the jobs of the future. He's trying to say we can treat American workers almost as bad as the Mexicans can. And that's how we're going to compete. Wow, Mark, if I'd said that, I would be I would be so uh, slandered on Facebook later tonight. Um, no, not no, at look, all. I'm, not I'm at not all. You see, I'm sorry, not attacking the Mexican people right. who okay. work very good. hard. Good, I'm good. attacking the Mexican economic system yeah. where you've got a few extremely rich well, people I'll put Governor and Perry. vast numbers of extreme poor. Right. It seems to me that we are competing right now in two markets. All right. We're competing against uh, Mexican, Indian, and Chinese laborers who work often children working for 50 cents a day, whatever it is. And that's this is not one, the case in America. That's that's one place we can go. Okay. No, in fact, people are offshoring to get uh, to get those. I mean, a, even Apple Computer, a good liberal company. Wow, is, is, you is, said it. Well, no, but they they are in Shenzhen getting 14-year-old Chinese Malaysia. labor yeah. all over making their computer yeah. parts. Yeah. So it's it's it, it's not obviously it's not just Apple. It's virtually right. every corporation in right. the nation. So this is. I'll going, put Governor Perry's 10-year record of job creation against any any other state in the union. My any blue state, any Democrat governed state. He's competing us down, not competing. Well, the other states. That aren't creating any jobs aren't competing against anybody. He needs to compete against Germany and Sweden. We need a better education to do that. This we'll debate is not finished, Matt Robbins. We will continue. Absolutely, into always. The political season. Hope you enjoyed the Inside Scoop. If you want to know more about it, just go to my website, RadioInsideScoop.com. This is Mark Levine. Sign.